Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, the launch of the Global Carbon Budget 2020. My name is John Walton, and I'm the communications lead uh, at Future Earth. Uh, I'll be your MC today. I'm just going to run you through the show here. Um, we'll let people trickle in, but uh, let me just go over who you'll be hearing from today. Uh, first, we have Josh Tewksbury, who's the interim executive director for Future Earth, who's going to provide some welcoming remarks. Then we're going to hear from the core research team behind this project, uh, Corinne LeQuery, who is the Royal Society Research Professor at the University of East Anglia School of Environmental Sciences. Uh, we also have Pierre Frigentstein, the chair of the Mathematical Modeling of the Climate System at the University of Exeter. And we're also joined by Matthew Jones, a senior research associate at the University of East Anglia School of Environmental Sciences as well. Um, so I'll turn over to Josh uh, Tewksbury now, who's going to provide some introductory remarks, and then we'll get into the presentation. Josh, over to you. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you all for joining us today to explore this important research in some more detail. My name, as John said, is Josh Tewksbury. I'm the Interim Executive Director of Future Earth, the world's largest network of sustainability scientists. At Future Earth, we host some 27 different research networks and projects spanning themes from biodiversity to land use to the health of our oceans. <laughs> Our global community of researchers have helped introduce and now shape our understanding of the Anthropocene, a proposed geologic epoch in the history of Earth marked by the influence of humans on the planet. And the Global, Car the global Carbon Project is one of the strongest research projects we have the honor to support. This network of scientists from around the world produces budgets for methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide, the three dominant greenhouse gases that are the driving force behind climate change. And for CO2, they have been doing this work for the past 16 years, delivering exactly the science that is needed directly into the Conference of Parties each year. And we are now at a decisive moment. To meet the Paris Agreement, we must cut our emissions in half in the next decade. The work of the Global Carbon Project provides the knowledge base needed to support policy actions around the world to meet that goal. And this is not an arbitrary goal. The impacts of climate change are being felt today around the world. And we must curb and ultimately eliminate the buildup of these gases in the atmosphere, which now threaten to push us out of the stable climate niche that humans and many other species have relied on for millennia. Today, you'll hear from world-class researchers as they present the most complete and up-to-date picture ever of global fossil fuel emissions and the impacts of those emissions on the global carbon cycle. Understanding how our planet is changing and how human societies are driving that change is an existentially important endeavor. And I wanna congratulate our presenters and the full team on completing this critical research. Finally, I wanna recognize, you know, uh, recognize all of you in the room for the equally important work you do in helping get these messages out to the world. Thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. Just a quick reminder, everyone, um, the contents of this media briefing, as well as the press release, are embargoed until 7 p.m. Eastern time tonight. Um, after that, um, uh, you feel free to release. But we do have uh, online uh, data sets, um, visualizations, and other materials for you. And I'll link to that in the chat. Um, as we go forward, this is going to be a Q we're going to utilize the Q&A function uh, in Zoom to ask questions. So at any time throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A uh, box. Um, you can also up upvote. Uh, certain questions um, to make sure that we get the ones, uh, the right ones answered. Uh, but I'll be sure to, to run through those um, right after the presentation. So I'd like now to hand over to Pierre, who's going to take us through uh, the Global Carbon Budget 2020. Pierre, over to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks a little bit for taking you through the slides. So this is, okay, well, first, I mean, welcome to all. And well, thanks for the great introduction first. And yeah, as you said, we are, we are here to present to you I mean, the 15th edition of the Global Carbon Budget. It's an annual update that we do. And if you can go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. No, 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 no. Sorry. The one before. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, I mean, this is an well, international effort for this. I mean, uh, need like contribution from. Well, we say 86 people on the paper, but actually much more people involved, I mean, as well. So about hundreds of people, many institutions across the world and funding agencies. And what we do is we try to provide uh, an up-to-date information on the emissions of CO2 from human activities, namely fossil fuel emissions and land use changes, but also the fate of these emissions in the system the accumulation of CO2 in the atmospheres and the partitioning between the land and the ocean carbon sinks. Next slide, please. 
Okay, for the emissions, I will pass to Corinne to carry on. Uh, thank you. Um, could you, could I ask if you could stop my video, please? Uh, thank you very much. And I will take the next slide. I will present now uh, the results for uh, the fossil fuel uh, emissions. So the projection is for the fossil fuel emissions to decrease this year. That's expected. A decrease of 2.4 billion tons of CO2 is a record uh, decrease, though. We have never um, registered uh, such a large change. It's 7% change. Um, you can see, though, that even before this decrease occurred, uh, the global uh, CO2 emission had already started to falter. Uh, we had a change in emissions for the decade prior to 2019 that were about one, an increase of 1% per year. You see that 2019 itself had almost no growth at all. And there were a few years between 2012 and 2016 where there was also no growth uh, in emissions. And the full recent decade has a growth in emissions that is much smaller than what we have observed in the decade before that, so that's 2000 to 2009. Um, research published elsewhere suggests that the faltering of the emissions in the last decade is at least in part uh, due to uh, the response of the growing number of climate and energy policies uh, worldwide. Uh, next slide, please. So a decrease in uh, 2.4 billion tons of CO2 uh, has never been uh, seen uh, before. We have seen decreases in the past. Uh, significant decreases occurred during the oil crisis in the 1980s, the collapse of the Soviet Union in early 1990s, and the global financial crisis in 2008-2009. Uh, and we have to go uh, to World War II, where there was a very big decrease to find a decrease that in percent was bigger than today and in absolute value was still smaller. Um, one thing to note is that uh, the rebound uh, after the 2008-2009 global financial uh, uh, crisis. So it's I, it, maybe you can point to the big white circle in 2009. Saw at that time an increase in global emissions of yes, thank you, uh, 1.9 uh, 1 um, billion tons of CO2. So really quite substantial, comparable in size to the decrease that we see now. Uh, emissions will most likely rebound in 2021 as confinement measures are already less stringent now than earlier in the year, but it is too early to infer uh, the level of the 2021 rebound, and I will dig into 2020 uh, emissions in a minute. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, the decline in 2020 emissions occurred on top of pre-existing trends. So in the United States and the uh, European Union, uh, there were large decreases in emissions this year. So 12% for the US, 11% for the EU, uh, mostly because the confinement measures in place were quite extended in time and extensive in these two regions. But these take place on top of reductions in emissions um, that were uh, <clears throat> driven by decreases in coal use uh, at those re regions that have been accelerated uh, by um, the COVID-19 confinement measures. Uh, in India, the emissions were already um, lower than normal in late 2019 because of economic turmoil and because of a good year for hydropower, in fact, and the COVID-19 signal is superposed on these trends. And in China, uh, the decrease associated with COVID is relatively small, uh, estimated at 1.7% um, by the team here. And uh, these uh, effects uh, occurred uh, on top of rising emissions. Uh, the reason why the China decrease is lower though is because China had an early onset of the pandemic and uh, had therefore a lot more time uh, to recover from the pandemic than other regions. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, now, this is by fuel type this time. Uh, you see the, the, the time series on top. The brown one is the coal use. It declined globally already in 2019 in spite of the increasing use in China. The big drop in coal use in the US and in Europe uh, really were sufficient to bring this down uh, along with lower use of coal as, elsewhere. In contrast, uh, emissions for, from oil and, oil and gas use uh, before uh, 2020 were uh, rising uh, steadily. Uh, oil use has been uh, much affected this year uh, because of its association and its use in transport, and gas use has been affected because of the general economic trend. Uh, with the next slide now, I'm going to do a deep dive in the 2020 emissions. Now, um, I forgot to say that our estimates for 2020 are based on four uh, methods. Three are based on um, indirect observations and one is based on monthly emissions data, but for a part of the world up to about October. So, what I'm showing here is the individual results for two of these four methods, the ones that have the most information over the full 2020. Um, the left one, the one on the left hand side is, is a study that I led myself, which we have updated with the global carbon budget. And it looks, it assesses the effect of the COVID restriction only. So these are the policy restrictions to um, try to uh, impose social distancing uh, on sectors of the economy. And what you can see there in green is that the decreases in emissions from surface transport uh, really accounts for the largest share of the decrease uh, in global uh, emissions. And the peak in emissions occurred at the uh, early in early uh, April. Um, you can uh, also see that uh, since the peak of emissions, the emissions have recovered. They have come back up, not yet to their 2019 level in that analysis of COVID effects only. And you see the second wave of the pandemic also caused the emissions to go down, but a lot less than the first wave. One, because it was less ex extensive and two, because the measures were a lot lighter. Now, when you look on the right hand side, so this is data from the carbon monitor, uh, this method uh, not only has the, impl the impact of the COVID pandemic, but it has everything else in addition because of the way it is designed. So it will include early signs of economic recovery. It will include also natural variability, for example, in temperature. Uh, that cause variability in, in emissions. But what you see there is that the trend that I mentioned in terms of the surface or ground transport accounting for most of the uh, uh, change, uh, not most, but the largest fraction of the global change this year is really robust. And um, the aviation sector is the one that was most affected by the pandemic, but it, it's a sector that accounts for just under 3% of the global emissions in a, in a normal year. So even if it was hardly hit, uh, its effect on emissions is less. And the last uh, very interesting point here from the carbon monitor is that the industry data, which you see in, in yellow here, although it's a bit early to say because this is concerns only one month of data, the last one available in October, but industry data in 2020 appear to have recovered worldwide uh, to be above the 2019 level. And this is drawn up uh, by industry uh, in, in China, mostly with industry in the US, for example, still being uh, below 2019 uh, levels. Um, I will uh, stop here and hand over to uh, now Matt will take the next slide. Thanks, Corinne. Yes, so I'll be talking about uh, land use change emissions in the 2020 budget. And if we could skip straight to the next slide, please, that would be great. Uh, so uh, our uh, preliminary est estimates for 2020 indicate that um, emissions from land use change are similar to the average for the previous decade, at around 6 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. This year, we have taken a kind of extra step and provide further estimates of the gross CO2 emissions um, and the gross CO2 sinks from land use change. And the balance of these figures is what gives the overall land use change flux. 
So uh, gross emissions are mostly made up of tropical deforestation fires. Um, and in total, gross emissions emitted about 16 billion tonnes of CO2 per year during the past decade. These emissions also come from peat burning and wild areas that have been degraded by nearby human activities, uh, particularly at forest edges. Uh, the gross sinks have averaged about 11 billion tonnes of CO2 over the past decade. And these are mostly caused by the, the abandonment of agricultural land. Uh, historically, the gross sinks have been particularly large in China and the US. Both the gross emissions and the gross sinks from land use change have crept up over the past half a century. Uh, but on, and on balance, emissions from land use change have not changed significantly in that period. But handing land back to nature has really helped to offset emissions from deforestation in recent decades. We can expect similar benefits to come from reforestation and rewilding programs in future. Uh, combining these actions with serious reductions in deforestation would certainly help to bend the line back towards zero. In 2020, land use change emissions were lower than in 2019, and this relates mostly to patterns we've seen in the tropics. Uh, so 2019 was likely the biggest deforestation year since 2008 in Amazonia. But what really made the difference was uh, in 2019 was a big spike in peat burning and deforestation in Indonesia. Uh, and that's also been seen in previous drought years like 1997. So uh, I'll hand over now back to Pierre. Thank, thank you, Matt. Uh, next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide? Can you hear me? All right, I thank you, excellent. That. Yeah, well, I'm assuming everyone can know. Thank you. So well, I will put these numbers on emissions and from fossil fuel and from land use. It was just presented to you I mean, back in the context of the global carbon cycle and the human perturbation. So this slide is showing you the global carbon budget. This is an average for the last decade, 2010, 2019. And you see on the left, I mean, the emissions that we just discussed, fossil fuel 34, land use change six. So there's a total of 40 billion tons CO2 emitted into the atmosphere on the average over the last 10 years, every single year. Of course, I mean, this is increasing every year, except for 2020, and we just discussed. A large fraction of these emissions still remains in the atmosphere. There's a blue dot in the center of the diagram. You see plus 19, there's a CO2 accumulation in units of PPM part per million. This is about 2.5 2, 2. PPM increase per year, every single year. And you see the land and the ocean, the biospheric sinks and the ocean sinks, they're removing CO2 from the atmosphere, I mean, respectively, I mean, 13 and 9 billion tons per year. But as I said, altogether, there is still an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, which you can see in the next slide. So this slide is showing you the global CO2 concentration in the atmosphere over the last, well, 60 years now, since I mean, the start of these measurements in Mount Aloha. And you see that every single year, CO2 has been going up because of human activities. For 2020, as I said, I mean, it's still increasing despite the reduction in emissions, the CO2 is still going up by 2.5 ppm. We are reaching now 412 ppm on the average globally for 2020. This is, I mean, up to 40% above pre-industrial levels. In order to well, stabilize the climate, I mean, CO2 emissions need to be reduced, as, as eventually down to zero, in such a way that CO2, at the atmospheric CO2 will stop increasing, will actually start, I mean, slowly decreasing, thanks to the natural things, and the climate will stabilize. Uh, so, in order to be, I mean, uh, consistent with the Paris Agreement, I mean, to limit warming, I mean, well below two degrees and with an aspiration to 1.5. I mean, we need to have emission cuts by the order of one to two billion tons CO2 every single year in the coming decades. So we could say that to summarize this presentation and I mean this 
inside on 2020, we are in a unique position in 2020, not just because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on emissions that, we, that you've seen, the slowdown in emissions and the, at the same time, I mean, the emergence of pre-existing climate policies across the world, the net zero commitments, which has been proposed by many countries across the world, again, and the top countries, they are committed to go to net zero by around 2050, 2060. I mean, altogether represent more than 60% of the global emissions as of today. So it is significant in terms of countries. So this, this brings us a unique opportunity to, I mean, to break permanently the rise in CO2, the long-term growth in emissions, and eventually achieve the ambitions of the Paris Agreement. Of course, I mean, these uh, ambitions need to be followed by actions, and this is what we'll be monitoring as a global carbon cycle and be reporting to you every year from now on. Okay, on this note, I want to thank you all for well, attending this briefing and we are opening the floor for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pierre. All right, um, everyone, if you have questions, please utilize the Q&A function um, on the bottom right of your screen and I'll be monitoring that to ask questions to our panelists while we have them on. Um, we have. I think we have our time through the end of the hour, so uh, feel free to uh, submit uh, any questions you might have on the, the findings or uh, other implications of this research. Um, Corinne, if I could just start off by maybe asking you um, if there are any uh, obvious policy implications from your work um, with the COVID-19 lockdown effects on emissions, given, it's, given the differences in how it's affecting each industry, do you see any kind of clear pathways forward for policymakers in, in trying to lock in some of those savings? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there has been some really massive disturbance in the road transport sector with people having to uh, stay home as much as possible and work from home. And the worry is, of course, as we go back to work eventually, uh, that, and the social distancing measures having to stay in place, how this is going to be organized uh, forward. And there is indeed an opportunity here uh, to encourage and support um, different uh, forms of living in a way. Uh, so encouraging and supporting perhaps work at home or making place for walking and cycling in cities where it is possible. Uh, it is though unavoidable that we need also to tackle um, uh, the transportation from uh, individual cars in particular. And the solution there is really to move as quickly as possible uh, to uh, electric uh, cars, electric mobility, and that's supported by uh, deployment of renewable energy. So there is really an opportunity now because of this shock that the sector has received to uh, imagine uh, things forward and to really guide the direction of the economic stimulus packages. Great, thank you very much. Pierre, is there anything you'd like to add on that topic? It's Corinne's specialty, so yeah, I think her Sorry, answers are no, pretty solid. Needed, but it was perfect. <laughs> Well, in lieu of um, some of the questions that are, have yet to come in, I, I wondered if uh, you, this is your second press briefing on this re report today, and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to venture uh, forward the, the kind of harder questions that you received in your last, last press event. Uh, where do you think some of these ambiguities lie around the research, and what can you help clarify for our listeners here? Mm -hmm. And Pierre, maybe we can start with you. Uh, what I... I would say most of the question we had this morning was really about, I mean, the impact of COVID-19 on, on why did it happen, and especially what can we expect in the near term? Will be will we have like a rebound in 2021, for example, or can we, I mean, hope to stay as I mean, level as high as low as, as we have now? And I mean, of course, it was well, it's an open question. It's hard to answer, but we have I mean, some signs showing that in when in some place, some region, there is a rebound. And it um, might be just like a natural rebound, of course, and then we will slowly go into like a decrease in emissions in the longer run. But uh, yeah, it seems almost inevitable there will be some rebound. We won't stay at the 2020 level in 2021. We will go back to somewhere between 2020 or 2019, even, even both. Uh, 
Corinne, Matt, you want to? Yeah, I mean, I maybe Matt actually, uh, you could perhaps uh, elaborate a little bit on this land use change oh, yeah. and uh, yeah, sure. the opportunities there. Yes. yes. Yeah, we had some really, really great questions this morning about, uh, I suppose, the role of land use change in achieve, achieving net zero in the future. And um, I, I think really the gist of, of what we want to get across is that it's going to be really a pivotal and important um, factor in bringing uh, emissions down to net zero, because there are some emissions that are difficult to deal with, in particular from aviation and from agriculture. Um, so going forward, uh, what we really need to be able to do is, is um, start trying to enhance the land sink by essentially giving natural vegetation more room to, to, to grow and prosper and to ultimately uptake uh, or take up CO2, providing a lasting sink into the future. And maybe Corinne would like to add to that, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I do want to say that um, managing land better is essential to tackle climate change, that it has to be done and that it, because it's the first year that we report uh, deforestation and regrowth separately, it, it really is the first time that we can identify just how big these opportunities are in the land. So deforestation occurs mostly in the tropics at the moment and therefore reducing deforestation could reduce these gross fluxes of 16 billion tons of carbon that we have seen. And then regrowth occurs mostly in the land where um, the agriculture, they've been overexploited, the soils are really poor and that land is, is abandoned. And uh, this is mostly in uh, places that have this uh, deforested historically like uh, Northern Hemisphere, China, US, uh, Russia, uh, to some extent. And uh, you see there that if we can manage better this and if we can afforest, the US has a big forestry program that is very active in this area. China as well has a very big afforestation program. Uh, we can really like drive these things, uh, increase the size of these things. So this is really the way to create the simplest, the most safest way to create an, a, a carbon sink that can, at the end of the day, when we've done everything else, can offset some of the remaining emissions. We did have a question come in. It's two parts, so I'll just start with the first. Um, this can be for anyone, but how does the 7% annual de decrease in emissions projected for 2020 um, compare with the reductions needed to the Paris Agreement? So maybe a bit more elaboration on that topic, uh, either Pierre or Corinne. Corinne, you want to start? I don't mind. Corinne, Corinne seems to be frozen. Corinne was frozen on my boat. Oh, she's, okay. she's returned. We lost. Okay, so I will start and then she can compliment. Uh, well, I mean, to, yeah, I mean, for, to achieve the, I mean, the, the Paris Agreement ambitions, I mean, 1.52 degrees, I mean, we need, I mean, to set, I mean, emissions to zero. By, by, by 2050 at least, well, for 1.5 and maybe slightly longer for, 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 two, for two degrees. And essentially this comes to reducing emissions by about one to two billion tons per year, every year, maybe one for, for two degrees and, and two for two, yeah, two, two billion tons per year for 1.5. So what we've seen this year, it's consistent with what is needed. So. Yeah, if we could do this every single year for the next, I mean, 10, 15, 20 years, and then of course the longer term kind of like also depend of what, how do we deal with negative emissions and all of these things. But yeah, this is the level of reduction which is needed, I mean, to stay within, I mean, the Paris, uh, the Paris Agreement ambition. The second part of that question was, uh, if, if you were to use history as a guide, um, how much of a bounce back in emissions can we expect uh, in 2021? And you know, this, this may be difficult given the kind of unprecedented nature of COVID-19, um, but are there projections that you're willing to make at this stage with the data that you have available? Corinne, you're muted. Sorry, Corinne. If you want to in. Thank you. Uh, yes, I can uh, speak to this. Um, what we have seen in the past is that the rebounds actually puts the emission not quite on track or not always on track, I should say, to where they were before, but eventually in, in the course of not many years back, back on track. 
It's not happened in the past that we had concerted action at the end of a crisis to really globally turn down the course of the emissions. In 2008, 2009, there were concerted action for uh, investment in renewable energy, wind, solar power, uh, big investments from the US, China, uh, Germany in particular, that led to a uh, fall of prices afterwards. But no countries in the last crisis really took their economic stimulus plan and say, OK, this has to be aligned with climate target. What do I need to do? This did not happen. This case is a little bit different. Um, in Europe, the European Commission has sent some guidelines for the countries to have at least 30% of their stimulus plan be aligned with um, investments in the low carbon uh, economy. However, there are still this other 70% of the investment that it's unclear whether this will play against or whether there is any attention that will be put there. So there's still a, a question of coherence here. And worldwide, at the moment, uh, the uh, index of greenness of uh, economic stimulus plan are really uh, not very uh, green. I have to say they're actually very dominated by investment in the sort of conventional economy. And if this continues, if there is no change, then I completely expect that the path of the emissions will come back, if not on the rise, then not, not far off the level of previous emission. And maybe just one last point, sorry to dominate the speech here, uh, just one last point, is what happens next year, uh, so 2021, uh, depends a lot on whether how fast we uh, manage the pandemic, the exit of the pandemic and whether governments may put in place very short-term action like um, encouraging people to walk, walk and cycle in, in cities. Uh, otherwise, most likely, like we're seeing in China now, the rest of the world will follow. I think one follow-up question uh, that's pretty relevant regarding headlines that we've seen over the last year is to what degree are the wildfires that we're seeing around the globe uh, influencing these numbers and figures? So do we have an estimate of how much carbon is released from that and is it significant enough to, to be visible in the data? Yeah, that's for Matt. <laughs> Yeah, in terms of the numbers, um, I, I mean that actually appears in the in the land flux for these wildfire, big wildfire events in um, in Australia and the US. So that's uh, what, what they have what they have the effect of doing is reducing the land sink. Um, so something key around the topic of wildfires is that in the long run we expect this carbon to be recaptured through recovery, as long as of course the land is is uh, is left to recover. To its natural state um, and kind of left alone, um, the problem happens really when you kind of have the, this uh, land grabbing effect, where land has been cleared by a natural wildfire, um, and it's kind of opportunistic. Say you're you're a farmer and you've got um, some land backing onto an area that's just been um, cleared by wildfire. In some parts of the world, you may well be really quite tempted to move into that um, area and expand where you're growing your crops or where you're herding your animals. So this is the sort of um, uh, behavior which needs to be discouraged um, because that has a that would have a really detrimental knock-on effect to the land sink for the years to come. Another factor though to consider is that the emissions, um, if, if we keep having these big fire years with large emissions, uh, the, the total amount of storage on it, of carbon on land and in vegetation is is set to reduce and that itself contributes to a rise in co2 emission uh, atmospheric concentrations of co2 it can contribute to to warming and positive feedbacks which which um, can contribute to more fires um in the long run so it, it's a it's a delicate situation and what really needs to happen is land needs to be encouraged to recover naturally and to capture carbon as quickly as it can um, and and absolutely um, the most important thing is that this land is left to left to recover maybe pierre has some more to say on that no i think it was great i mean just just to say that i think yeah what what is, what is key is i mean 
is the, the, the link between climate change and I mean the frequency of the wildfires because of course wildfires are natural and the, we had wildfires I mean for the entire history of, 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 the, of the terrestrial biosphere and they are part of the system as, as Matt was saying there is a fire CO2 is being released and then I mean the forest regrows and take back the, the CO2 that was released during the fire and in the long run there is no impact on the on the atmosphere However, if wildfires are becoming more frequent or more intense because of increasing temperature, because of drying, then it destabilizes this I mean, balance between sources and sink due to wildfire. And you end up with, as Matt was saying, reduced biomass on land because it doesn't have time to regrow because the, between the next the, the current and the next wildfire. And therefore, this added CO2 goes into the atmosphere, it stays in the atmosphere. I think a follow-up uh, question to that, which is somewhat related in that we've been seeing uh, quite a few headlines on this throughout the year as well, and Matt, this may be for you, uh, is the warming of the Arctic and whether we know now whether there is being uh, other greenhouse gases released um, and uh, if, if that's having an effect on warming, if that's visible yet. Uh, and the other, in the other research that you guys have done, I know this is uh, maybe not relevant to this particular uh, launch, but uh, just, just wondering if there's anything you can say on that uh, on, for that topic. Yeah, I could say a little bit on the effects of the Arctic warming on, on fires, for example. So certainly we're seeing an increase in um, the conditions that support wildfire in, in the Arctic. So we're seeing higher temperatures, lower humidity, um, lower precipitation in some areas. And that's probably something that's contributing to these large um, wildfire events that have happened of late, especially in, in Siberia. Um, in terms of uh, Arctic warming more generally, there's of course the issue of permafrost thawing. And I think maybe Pierre would like to say a bit more about that. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Well, yeah, well, mm -hmm. well, first is, well, it's a bit beyond the scope of the global carbon budget. So it's more like my personal, I mean, well, well knowledge and, and an opinion about, about this than, than an outcome of the current budget. So yes, of course, I mean, warming would induce permafrost towing and it would release, I mean, carbon in the form of CO2 and or methane. And both of them are greenhouse gases, we know. So they would trigger positive feedback. The magnitude of this feedback as we speak today is probably still limited. There are some indication of higher methane concentration in Arctic regions, and it's still not fully, fully clear if this is 100% due to permafrost towing or is it because of other uh, emission increase. Uh, likewise for CO2, we can't detect yet in the atmosphere CO2 uh, observation system an increase in CO2 concentration due to the towing. So we do rely on models to say that this will happen in the future and this will indeed contribute to accelerating the warming. But at least according to the last IPCC report, I can't say for the prison, the pre, the prison one from, from the last IPCC report, it does add CO2 in the system. Yeah, and for like a very high emission scenario like RCP 8.5, which is about, which would emit something like 200 gigaton carbon in the coming century, this would lead to an additional increase of CO2 of maybe five to 10%. So the main driver of warming in the near term is still fossil fuel emissions. Yep, helpful, thank you. Uh, quick follow up question to the wildfire topic is um, if the 12% reduction that, that is estimated for the United States this year uh, factors in the, these record wildfires that have been occurring on the West Coast. Um, so just seeing if you guys could clar clarify that. So I guess the short answer is now, I mean, the 12% reduction is in fossil fuel emissions only, which has been, I mean, estimated from Korean and the other three studies. And we presented the average of these studies and we come up with 20% decrease in fossil fuel emissions from the different sectors that we presented, which is, I mean, transport industry and so on. It doesn't include wildfires. So wildfires are included in the natural land sink, and so that would be implicitly a reduction of natural land sink. Yeah, but it's not part of the 12%. That's that's right. Yeah. Here's a question that's kind of taken a different angle, and you know, feel free to answer uh, at your peril. But um, 
here's, here's the question, I'll just read it verbatim. Uh, what should we make of the fact that it took a global economic catastrophe to slash emissions to the rate needed for the Paris Agreement? Is this discouraging? And do you think there are there, there are any lessons about how we can achieve these reductions sustainably? So I'll leave it to you to see who would like to volunteer. Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so, I mean, it's clear that we have not understood uh, what it takes to tackle climate change. And this pandemic and the response to it and the effect on emissions really shows what is the scale of the challenge that we have to face. And therefore, what is the scale of the action that needs to be put in place? So now is the time where governments have to follow their commitments with large scale actions, with plans, detailed plans to move out of fossil fuels in all the sectors of the economy. So that's the first lesson. The second lesson is that mostly the emissions this year drop because of behavior change. Uh, forced behavior change that did not change anything structural. So we have the same cars, the same roads, the same industry and so on. And so as soon as you lift the behavior change, then we go back to uh, the emissions as they were uh, before. So that really shows that, uh, whereas it is clear that behavior change will uh, play a part in tackling climate change, this is not the main driver of tackling climate change. The driver of tackling climate change is to make investments in uh, this infrastructure that we need to function. So that's renewable energy, that's electric mobility, that's planting forests to get the sink in, that's electrifying all the process. And, and there's just lots of them and we have the solutions, uh, but we really need to move on with the implementation. Thank you, Corinne. Pierre, do you wanna add anything to this? No, I think it's, it's, it's pretty good. We can move to the next question. Yeah, this is more of a clarifying question for the Global Carbon Project as a whole. Um, so this year there was three budgets released and the question is, can you share with us this, uh, sig the significance of these undertakings and what's gonna be coming up in the next year? So uh, from, from my perspective, you, uh, there are budgets on methane, nitrous oxide and carbon produced every year. So that this will continue to happen into the future. Um, but if uh, more details, if, if you'd like. What? You want to start, Matt or Corinne? Or... Um, I, I can say maybe just a few words and, and Matt, perhaps you could chip in with some of the analysis you've made looking at the three gases together yeah. uh, for the Verify project. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, it's been really exciting actually to see all these budgets. So the global carbon budget, we're, it's our 15th year now. And we have for some years talked about doing a methane uh, budget. Uh, methane is a lot more complex than carbon dioxide. There's a lot of different um, uh, sources. Uh, many sources of methane are complicated like animals or wetlands. And, and, and permafrost, as, as was mentioned earlier, they're a lot more difficult to quantify with, with solid numbers. And so the research behind that is progressing, progressing rapidly, but we still have big questions. And the methane emission has started to rise again in the atmosphere after having had a plateau for I think it ended in 2010 or something. So there is some real interesting signal to explain. Uh, the N2O budget this year was the first one, and uh, that was also an interesting one. And what you can see actually is that um, these other gases really continue to rise very rapidly. And we know where, while we know a lot about carbon dioxide, uh, the tackling these other gases uh, will equally uh, be important. And maybe just one more thing, and then I'll hand to either Pierre or Matt is that um, carbon dioxide and N2O, so nitrous oxide, they're long-lived greenhouse gases. So we, they really need to be brought down to zero to tackle climate change. Whereas methane is a short-lived greenhouse gases, so it can be decreased and that would uh, in principle, at least also uh, help to tackle climate change, but the constraints on it are less stringent. Yeah, so I can pick up from there. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, obviously, we're moving towards a position where we have the three um, budgets in place and we can work towards a multi 
gas budget essentially that that relies on uh, radiative forcing um, or the contribution of the various gases to radiative forcing. Um, a challenge at the moment uh, that we're facing is with the, with the methane budget, there is still some uh, disagreement between inventory-based emissions and uh, emissions based on inversion models. Um, so essentially two different methods of, of tracking how much methane is being emitted, from, particularly from natural landscapes. So that's something that I know is being worked on and I think we'll be in an even stronger position to get towards a multi-gas budget once that's been resolved. In terms of what I'm doing as part of my contribution to verify, I'll just say quickly that I, I'm looking specifically at the European case. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Great. Thanks, man. Well, we're getting close to the top of the hour, and I did want to give time to kind of have one last reflecting thought from each of you on what your key takeaway from this, re this research has been. Um, and maybe I'll I'll start with Josh, and then we can move through the research team um, to close out this session. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be short and just say that I, I think, you know, I want to just return to something that Pierre said in the beginning, and just to emphasize um, the, the critical importance of this kind of global research network in supplying the science needs for humanity, for, for societies around the world. And the fact that, you know, putting this together, that this community of scientists has been putting this together, you know, for a decade and a half with, um, with you know, fundamentally, you know, this is something that is not well enough recognized within communities within science and across sort of other sectors, the need for this kind of coordinated work. And it's, it doesn't get the most recognition um, and it's sometimes the most important work that science can do for society. And you know, funding organizations oftentimes um, are, are, more, are more apt to fund individuals than these big collectives. And yet this collective opinion of science is what moves the needle on policy. This fact that you can put this broad consensus statement forward. It's a tremendous amount of work to get this kind of consensus out of a scientific community that this that is this broad. And I just want to just hand it to the team for their, you know, their dedication to this work, which is often unsung and so valued by the rest of society. Thanks, Josh. Matt, maybe we can take you next. Yeah, I'd just like to say, uh, I mean, I, I'm a relatively new member of the Global Carbon Project uh, team. I've been contributing for the last two years, and it's something that, uh, as a PhD student and as a as a as a uh, undergraduate as well, I was so aware of the importance of this work. Um, it was it was always in a, a really key. It was essentially central to the learning that that we uh, we had at Exeter University. Um, on the global carbon budget and it's really uh, kind of the, the font of all knowledge on the global carbon cycle as far as I'm concerned. So I mean to now be part of the effort is actually really rewarding for me and I hope it continues into the future. Thanks Matt. Corinne, any closing thoughts on, on this project and what would you yeah, like the journalists um... to please? Yeah, I've been involved in the 15th release of the common uh, budget, and I really have the feeling this year that we've been here before. Uh, we've been in moments like this where we think actually things are going to happen, and the reality is things don't happen on their own. They really have to be driven by forces that uh, have a vision for the future. And I think with the position we were before the pandemic with the global emissions faltering, with real effects of climate and energy policy in place, uh, with real investments coming up in the next year or two, uh, we are in an opportunistic moment if we can just clearly see the path forward and align uh, uh, this economic stimulus packages with what is needed to tackle climate change, it could make a real difference. Thanks, Corinne. Pierre? Well, yeah, I'm not sure there's much to say anymore, but yeah, well, I mean, this is extremely challenging exercise. I mean, to bring all this information together in like a very short amount of time. Essentially, we start like before the summer or during the summer and we, well, we finish essentially like last night, I would say. And, <clears throat> But it's at the same time, it's extremely, I mean, well, interesting, fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm out of words, but because you have to tackle all of these different issues, you look at all different sectors from emissions, land use, ocean, 
biosphere and everything, and especially this year in 2020, when we started discussing the budget, I mean, before the summer, we said, okay, we have to do something about the, the COVID-19 impact on the emissions. And this is gonna be like a very special year, but it's, 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 it's critically important because all the implications on the long-term policies that we see from this budget. And I think it's, it is clear that it's, it's, it's really important. And as Corinne said, I mean, we are at a moment where things can go back to where they were and, and they are, Obviously, sectors of the economy, they are just dying to go back to where we were before because they can't survive otherwise, like aviation sectors, for example, it's obvious. And other sectors of the economy, like us working from home most of the time, Zooming all the time, and not even considering going into the office every single day. And, and this will happen for in many, many different sectors of the economy where people really kind of adapt to this change of habits and behavior, which is you don't have to travel back and forth between, I mean, suburbs and, 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 and downtown every single day. Some people will have to do because of the, 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 the work they do, obviously, but not everyone will have to do it. So yeah, I would stay hopeful for the future. That's my final word. Thank you. Good thoughts all around. Thank you very much. I'd just like to thank again uh, our, our panelists, Pierre, Corinne, Matthew, and Josh um, for taking the time to guide us through this great work. And um, this recording will be live um, at the end of the embargo today at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you all for joining and um, we'll see you in the next release. Thanks for organizing. Take thank care. You. Thank you.